one. Morning, KCM. Hopefully everyone is doing well this uh, fine Sunday and you obeying all the guidelines and keeping yourself safe and distances and uh, we'll just continue to go on with you know the way we need to do to keep ourselves safe. I know that you know we miss each other. I miss you. I know that you miss me and our family and uh, just keep enduring. One day we will be back together and we will be meeting but uh, as if we get any information on any changes we will let you know as soon as possible. But as we go right now, we will continue to provide these videos for you and um, hopefully you will gain something from it and we can reach out to each other this way. That being said, today uh, my topic is, uh, for our consideration, is my role in the kingdom of God. I want us to focus on that. One of the reasons I think when I was meditating on this, uh, I think the average Christian does pretty well, well in what we would call church life. It's sort of participating with their local church, you know, the meeting the tenants there with attendance and giving and being there and working within the ministry. But that's not everything that encompasses our role. That's important, and it, and it really is important. I don't mean to diminish that. But what we have to understand is once we're in the kingdom, we do have a role to assume. Just like when you have a play or a movie or a production, each one, each character is assigned a role. You know, not only do they get lines, but there's a reason for them to be in the movie and they have to contribute something to the complete story. If not, the movie won't make would not make sense if you don't have each character providing what they have. So, you know, if you don't have each character doing that, then a portion of what the writers and producers of the movie uh, are trying to present will be left out. It will be missing because there's, you know, this role wasn't fulfilled. There's a gap there. We don't understand that. So when we think about the kingdom of God, we, I want us to think of uh, our roles from an individual purpose. You say, okay, what do I, what will God have me to do? What do I need to do individually? As an individual, what is my role to be as a member of the, of the kingdom of God, not just a member of a church, not just attending church services? What is my role? What do I contribute to this story, to this uh, entity called the kingdom of God? See, after we are spiritually born again, we should have a new perspective about everything that we do. With this new perspective comes new responsibilities. A dreaded word, we do have responsibilities. In order that we will fulfill our new responsibilities, we must know and fulfill our individual role in God's kingdom. We must know and fulfill. We do have responsibilities in this kingdom. Our role is our responsibility, just as the actors are responsible for contributing their line and acting out certain scenes, we are responsible in the kingdom to do uh, something similar. We're using our foundation scripture for this particular part. This is just part one. Is John chapter 17, verses 15 through 22. John 17, 15 through 22. And as you see, we're going to eventually cover during the course of, of both of these parts, we're going to cover that entire chapter of uh, 17, of uh, St. John. And you look at a lot of commentary. I've seen other Bibles. They subdivide it. Some call it the prayer of Jesus, Jesus' prayer, the innocent, Jesus' intercessory prayer, and uh, one that's called it the Jesus' high priestly intercessory prayer. So there's certain things in this particular passage that basically the entire passage is about Jesus praying to the Father for certain things. And as believers, these things that he's praying for, interceding for, pertains to us. Now, 17, if you read this, and I would cost you to fit it into context, I would read from John 16 all the way through 18. Because what Jesus had promised in uh, 16, he promised the believers that, you know, that the Holy Spirit would be uh, given to them eventually. He's making them aware that he's getting ready to leave and that the Holy Spirit will be coming and given to them. That's in 16. 17, he praised the Father for, essentially the way I view it is the way that he wants this body of believers to function. 
what God is to endue them with once he leaves. And as we read the scripture, you'll see that. And then as you go to chapter 18, you see that Jesus is betrayed, he's tried, and then eventually, if you read on, he's crucified. So he puts this in as sort of a, not so much a, a last will and testament, it's his desire, like, okay, I've been sent to do something. Now, Lord, to ensure that this work bears fruit, this is what I am praying to you for these. This is how, this is how I want these believers to look on this earth when I leave. So that, that's the gravity of it. So uh, let's look at that. We're going to read. I want to read through it, and then we'll uh, discuss it. And, and Well, I, I will discuss it, and we will uh, move on from there. John 7, 17, starting at verse 15. And it reads, this is Jesus speaking the entire chapter. Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be as one as you Father are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now I want to sort of go verse by verse and try to expound upon what we can glean from each of these verses. In verse 15, Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now, when Jesus is talking about the world here, we may have different interpretations, but of course, to look that word up, because I don't want first to be confused myself, because if I get confused, then I'm gonna so confuse it. The world really means an orderly arranged system. The world system is a system. It's not a place. It's not just evil people. Some people think, okay, it's in the world. It's just everything that's bad is the world. No, the world, when Jesus is talking about the world, it's an orderly system and the inhabitants within that system. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It just has order. And as I thought about this, that could be, and I'm speculating here, don't take this as prophetic, that could be a reason that Jesus' manifestation came during the height of the uh, power of the Roman Empire. It was a worldly system. It was a system. When Rome conquered you, you had to submit to the Roman way of doing things or suffer the consequences. See, the power of Rome represents the world. It was a system of doing things. So what Jesus is telling us as believers, I'm sending you out into this organized, systematic way of doing things and the people that are in this systematic way of doing things. That's all it means. <laughs> so you can understand you're just not, when you're ministering to a person that's of the world, that is not in the kingdom, you're actually ministering to that system that they are subject to. See, that lets you know, uh, well, it allows me to know, and I think from that consideration, it would take our focus beyond an exchange between two people and more along the line, this is an exchange between two systems, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world, the system of the world, the system of God and the system of the world. And that's one reason why the, the organized church system, <laughs> the organized church, needs to be really diligent and I think very careful and mindful not to emulate the world system. <laughs> because if the church functions the same way the world system does, 
then people naturally must be confused. <laughs> they, and the thing is, you may not know you're confused because it's system versus system. And if there's no de delineation between the two systems, then, well, is it the church, is it the world? Can't mix the two. Because Jesus says, I've sent you into the world. He didn't say, I sent you to bring the world into the church. But don't bring the world into the kingdom. That, that was too uh, mutually exclusive. So Jesus let us know that we are to, that we are going to be in the world. He uh, didn't pray for us to be taken out of the world, but that we should keep us from the evil one. And the reason that is so that, you know, we are functioning under the authority of the kingdom of God to deal with a worldly system that is under the influence of an evil entity. It's under a system that's of an evil entity. So that naturally once you're submitted to this system, you're submitted to the entity that is has authority over this system. We don't want to get confused about we're dealing with people. I don't like this person is this. Otherwise, as believers, it's it's really kind of uh, fruitless to narrow its you know interactions down to just a person. Jesus would have us to know what system these people operate in, so we know how to function and represent the kingdom in spite of this kiss, this system. That's why I protect them from the evil one, evil one. Because if we're not protected from the evil one, we won't be able to, we'll not be able to distinguish between what's good and what's evil. <laughs> we will behave in a worldly systematic way without realizing because the enemy has deceived us and we would think that it's okay. When it's not okay because we're not of the world, as Jesus said. Verse 17 reads, it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, Jesus, when he says sanctify the believers, that means set them apart. Make them aware that they are set apart. Make them aware that they are not part of this worldly system. See, we don't need to attack the worldly system to be set apart. We just have to be set apart, and that automatically sets us at opposition to the worldly system. But it's an internal thing. And it's, some people may not agree with it. It's an internal thing where we don't necessarily have to attack and go out and protest the world system. But we need to be sanctified to God's system. Therefore, we will represent the kingdom of God without even having to oppose anybody. It's not so much that I oppose your way of doing things. Not so much I'm criticizing the way you do it. I'm not trying to raise a fuss about this or trying to get you this world system to change because it's not going to change because it's run by an evil entity that's not going to conform to the kingdom of God. Systems don't conform. People have to conform. So it's really fruitless to try to think a whole system is going to change over and just stop being what it is. Because in 16 he said we're not of the world just as Jesus is not of the world. We're not of this world system. But we're in the world system. Hopefully that's not confusing. Because the world system is, is produces, is the, the root of it is a, a manifestation of an evil intent, uh, intent. It's not meant to accomplish the thing that the kingdom of God uh, accomplishes. Therefore, we must be able to know the difference of, between the two and be protected from it. So in, in this dynamic, the believers in the kingdom of God, we play offense. We attack the world system by playing defense against the world system. We don't submit to it without even having to criticize it or protest it or do it. By not submitting to it, you're automatically creating an offense and pushing it back. This world system doesn't reign here. The kingdom of God reigns here. So Christ, uh, Christ in verse 18, it says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And that's important there, because Jesus is talking to God. So, okay, God, you sent me into this world system. 
to proclaim your name. That's basically what we'll get into that a little later. You sent me here. You the Father, God the Father sent God the Son into this world, this, world, this systematic way of things, during this particular time to proclaim his name. But Jesus says here, as you, Father, sent me, I also have sent them into the world. So what's the significance of that? Just as God sent Christ into the world to proclaim his name, Christ sends us into this world system to proclaim his name. To represent him. Not to start big churches and be on TV and all this other stuff and do all these peripheral things. To try to, you know, just put on this big production. See, individually he sends us. Because see, Jesus cried, uh, God didn't send a whole fleet of Jesuses down. He didn't send a whole group. He sent one. I'm sending one person to represent me in this system. And all what I want you to do is manifest me within this system. Not to go out and change the system. Not to try to destroy the system. Not to try to get the people in the system to come out of the system per se or to modify the system. No, I'm sending you in here just to represent me. Because that's what I want done. Because the, the beauty of that, brother and sisters, is is if each believer represented Christ in every situation of our life, we don't need to be at opposition with the world system. Because then what some people are going to do, be able to delineate Christ, they will see Christ, they will have faith, they will believe in Christ, and then they will change. See, the way to destroy the world system is for everybody to be converted into believers of Christ. And then the enemy has no subjects. All his minions, all his subjects will have flee to another kingdom. So you can't run a system without people. Once the people have left your system, guess what? Your system comes apart. That's how you destroy the system, is through individuals, not through trying to dismantle the system itself. Verse 20 says, Christ says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Christ is not only praying for the present believers, he's also praying for believers that's gone, going to come to his knowledge and, and become part and have faith in him and become part of God's kingdom because of the word of the various believers. Now you see how much power we have there. That Christ has already prayed for future members of the kingdom that will believe in our word. Because <laughs> see, Christ is going back to heaven. The mandate is on us that believe to go out and proclaim his word and better still to even live his word out for others to see. And that is how we are going to see that new believers are going to come in by the word of those that already believe. See, somebody that's not of a kingdom can't tell anybody about a kingdom they're not part of. So as representatives of the kingdom of God, everything that we do should represent the kingdom of God. Without having to, I'm not talking about being preaching and you know, walking around you know, with a Bible and a, you know, a ton of tracts and all the religious paraphernalia and all this other stuff. No, it's just a matter of us living in a way our word and our lifestyle. Anytime we're able to converse, we converse from a kingdom perspective. We converse from a perspective and don't get caught up with the big system and stay focused on the individual. Don't try to see if, okay, if I can identify sin and I need to pray for sin in this personal life, just proclaim sin. Christ. And if that opportunity arises, it, it will come. But that's not the, the most important thing right then. The most important thing is for this person to get revelation of the a true existence of another kingdom, another system outside of the system they live in. See, once somebody can make me aware that the system that I'm subject to is causing all this destruction in my life, guess what? I am willing, I am wide open to entertaining the opportunity to you know, embrace another system. That's what people really want, but they don't really know that's what they want. Because the church is not always proficient at showing 
this is a system versus system thing. We focus on, well, sometimes church focus on different issues, uh, get wrapped up in political things, and we have this agenda, we want this change, we want this type of person to do this, we want this to do that. Well, where is Christ in all this? Where is Christ? Where is that representation of Christ and all that? See, if you get bogged down in things that seem good, but they're not really good because we're not dealing with that individual level. And actually, it can be a trick of Satan to have us believers going out attacking systematic ways of doing things and think that we can change it, think we can hold up signs and eventually this system will fall just because we are in opposition to it. And I haven't seen where that's worked. If anybody does, please correct me. I'm subject to be corrected on that. I've not known anything that has dismounted an entire world system by mere protest. But once the individuals change, the system can change. Verse 21. And this is Jesus appealing to the Father. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they may also be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. I'm going to try to put this where we can comprehend it. Christ's desire from the Father is that we who believe may be one. Maybe we unite it, but not just unite it. Not on one accord. Not just go to the same building and have services at the same time, and be of the same denomination, or use the same version of the Bible, or meet on the same day, or whatever that may mean to us. It doesn't mean that. Jesus said He hopes that we, the believers, be one, as He and the Father are one. And Jesus is in the Father. Jesus said, you are in me and I in you. You in me and I in you. That they may also be one in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. So what Jesus is saying here, Father, as we relate, as we relate to one another, in relationship that we have to the degree that I am in you and you are in me, I want each believer to be in me and in you. So I may be in them and you may be in them. <laughs> and that may sound like some strange theology. Because once you're talking about in, it's almost like doing genetic coding on a spiritual level. So what Christ is saying is, as I and the Father, and you can include the Holy Spirit, as this Godhead is one, I want them to be one in us. Matter of fact, I want each believer to become spiritually part of the Godhead. <laughs> now why is that important? <laughs> For God to be one of us to be united with Him. <laughs> because to represent the kingdom, we have to have that kingdom anointed. We have to know. We can't go out and proclaim God without being in God. Without knowing who God is and without being empowered with God. I'm going to get to that a little later. We have to have God in us. I cannot represent God in my own power. I must be in Him. It's not me. Not what I done conjured up. I can sit back and scheme up some stuff. It might sound good to those that wouldn't know. But Jesus is talking on a level way beyond our ability just to get mental assent to something that sounds good, some theology that sounds good, or some denomination that sounds good, or some new uh, direction on something that may sound and we may perceive it being a good way to go, a new revelation. New revelation may come, but the final analysis is God wants us to be united with him. <laughs> Because that is what's going to unite us with each other. So whether we're here in North Carolina, or you're over in Germany, or in South America, Australia, or England, 
Japan. You can be anywhere and a person, any person that is a true believer that ascribes to this and knows what Jesus desires for us to do in our role, guess what? The role is the same. There will be no difference. God won't be presented in any other way. He won't divide himself up. So he needs to be the one so that whether a person, this world system, experience a believer anywhere on the face of this earth, it will be the same experience. It won't be from some different perspective. And I know that may sound like so far-fetched. <laughs> but since there's only one God, there can only be one representation of that God. You can only be united with him. You can't be united with something else and say that it's God. That, that doesn't work. He wants a, an actor uh, uh, is, is giving his or her strip, script, <laughs> their lines, their role. They don't have the authority to go out and just, oh, I'm just going to erase all this. I know this is what the creator of this plan has, but I think that this should go this way. And this is the danger. This, this is the disunification. This is what God does not want. This is what Jesus didn't pray for. So because I'm going to make up my own script, but I'm still going to create the impression I'm part of this production. But as the things start to play out and we start to interact, then I am not behaving. I am not saying or doing what the creator of this kingdom, of this final representation of himself is because I've gone off on my own. And I'm causing confusion. And guess what? We can do that to the point that other people may think, well, okay, he's gone off on his own. I don't really like my lines either. I think I'll modify these. <laughs> I don't know. I, think, I don't think my role is big enough. I need some more lines. I need to do it this way. I know this is what the Creator says I need to do, how I need to behave. But if I would just tweak this a little bit or change this or add this to it, I want to take this out, I think I can do better, you know. This will make me feel better about my role. I think my role would be better if I could modify it a little bit. But I said, no. Because Jesus said, he stuck by one mantra. I came to do the will of the Father. He did not change his script. He did not want to add on or try to be some different character. He didn't try to, you know, take over, be the headliner. Necessarily. He just said, I came to do the will of the Father. So if we as individual believers focus on this each and every day, I exist to do the will of the Father. <laughs> we all united in that one purpose. <laughs> just think about the power, the, the system, the world system could, wouldn't stand a chance if we all were united and that was our sole way of presenting ourselves. That was our sole motivation. We stuck to the script that God had written for us. We stayed on this road. We stayed united. Because I'm in Christ. So my only reason for existing is to, is to represent Christ. Because I'm united with Him. I want it to be where I go, He goes. What I say is what He says. What I do is what He tells me to do. Even to the way that I do it. Now that's not being a slave. That's being free. Because guess what? Doing that will also, if you go back, protect us from the evil one. Because now I'm not making stuff up and uh, subjecting myself to an attack because I'm not behaving properly. And another reason for that is that the world, if you read the end of 21, it says that the world, its whole purpose for that, that the world may believe that you sent me. See, our reason for existing is to bear proof to the world that God the Father sent God the Son and that God the Son died for the sins of all. He was resurrected and he purchased a place for us in heaven and we have a way through God the Son, the Christ, to become part of the kingdom. See, if, if, if the church behaves in such a way we will have people getting, we talked about getting saved and all this, and um, I understand that those are vernacular we use. I'm not complaining against because there's the deliverance. 
But if done in this way, if we're united in Christ, if we as all believers represented Christ, if we were effective as that as a body around the world, then people would be would come to believe that God sent Jesus, so they not understand if God sent him, then what he did was of God. So what I need to do is believe in this and submit my life to this. Now we're dismantling this world system piece by piece. An individual will be getting saved from the world without us having to uh, try to proclaim or really attack that entire system. It will be more subtle. And I think it will be more fruitful, it will be more comprehensive, it will be more effective because people are coming to realizations of where they want to be and how they should live. Not out of browbeating, not out of, you know, condemnation of fear, or getting them all emotional at one time, like a lot of time uh, ministry do on what, what they call Easter Sunday. Get them all emotional. Hey, we, you know, when I was a son of anybody, I bet we all know. When we were living in sin, we knew we were living in sin. And we didn't like it. <laughs> and if any time we get in a situation where we get all, all emotional about, okay, I'm going to go respond. Well, guess what? I didn't respond from a spiritual perspective. I just respond from a guilt perspective. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, busted. I, you know, you got me. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to feel better. But I haven't really changed necessarily. Because all I've done is feel guilty. <laughs> I haven't really repented. I don't think a different way. I don't see a different. I don't really acknowledge that God sent Jesus Christ and get the full revelation of what that truly means. I just had this one event. I call it the sugar high. You get all this surge. Oh, it's Easter. Let me become part. I get caught up in all this. I'm like, please. What you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess I'll go do what I normally do and Come back next Easter. <laughs> I don't know, at least one day a year I feel pretty good about myself. No, that's not the way it works. We in God every day it's like what we would call resurrection Sunday. <laughs> every day we continue to live, we are being resurrected. We have a chance to live and represent God. So it's, it's something that's long lasting. It, it's not just short term. This is not the short game. <laughs> This is a long game that we play because Christ actually has a role for us that is very, very vital in this three-dimensional realm to manifest the kingdom here on this earth. Verse 22. And the glory of which you gave me, I have given in this is Jesus Christ saying, the glory God that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. What did Christ talk about this glory? We look up that word glory there. Glory actually means the dignity, the honor, and the praise that you've given me. And it actually means to glorify, means to magnify. So God, because you have given me this dignity, honor, and praise, and you've magnified me, given this visibility I am giving it to them because for them to do what I desire for them the believers to do they must have from you father God what you gave me so what you gave me I must give to them for them to accomplish what we both desire for them to accomplish and actually this was, you know, this may sound like blasphemy to somebody, but if you're a believer, any believer, every believer has been glorified by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you reflect on your life, I just admonish you right now, any believers right now that are, that are listening, especially the KCM people, it doesn't have to be truly all, anybody that's watching. I want you to reflect briefly on your life and look at situations where you have been put in or had the opportunity to be in situations where you could impact other people. Not saying that we were better, but God, you know, I was trying to make, understand that glorification to be in a realistic term, something that's not so existential and we think, okay, I've been glorified, what does that mean? 
certain just reflect on your life in certain situations you've been able to do something or say something that has benefited someone because of the way God parted you, where he had you. So you may think glorification is one thing that's going to always put you in some high and mighty, oh, well, God glorified me, he set me up, he promoted me, he gave me a big car, a big house, a lot of money, blah, blah. no, it's not necessarily that. Glorification is about positioning. That can be a situation where somebody was down and out, may have had you be at work and they just had, a, you didn't know they were having a tremendous day, but you come in and God is some way your past intersect. <laughs> And you get to say or do something to this person that you don't realize the impact of it. And all of a sudden, this person's demeanor has totally changed. You have totally been a blessing to them. That's because God has glorified you. Everything you have done that has brought positive, godly results in people's life is a result of God glorifying you. And don't think it's some little small thing. God glorified you just to smile at people, to speak to people, to notice people. God glorifies us to submit to things that, you know, in the workplace that will promote the peace and efficiency of getting tasks accomplished instead of wanting to fuss and fight like everybody else and be rebellious or just always causing problems. See, that glorification allows you to say, okay, this may be uncomfortable because I'm sure Jesus went up there, oh, well, I just love this cross, this cross experience. I could just go through this every day. No, he, I'm sure he wasn't thinking that. So we have the same thing, that glorification comes, it's given to us that we may be able to endure these situations. We may have what we need when these situations arise to be able to present that unity in God. So people don't need to see us, our flesh, the way I think. <laughs> the fact that I'm tired, I'm tired of coming in, I'm tired of having to argue all the time, I'm tired of being underpaid, I'm tired of being neglected, I'm tired of being overlooked for emotion. I'm tired of just working here, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of seeing people advance above me that don't know as much, that blah, blah, it all that. But see, when God glorifies us, it's for His purpose. And that's a that's situation that God will put us in where we're able to glorify Him and think the ultimate glory when Christ went on the cross to take on the sins of the whole world. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, that's incomprehensible to me. But understand, he gives us that glory because he was lifted up and God has right now given him favor, which he's given us that same favor, which means that Christ was able to endure all these things and still represent God. We are able to endure all things and represent God to this world. That's our reason for being here. So when Christians are trying to pray their way out of situations, there's not necessarily, it's not anything to death or anything where it's like, you know, I'm okay and not that I really need anything I just want more <laughs> sometimes we get that we don't really reflect on what we already have that's not glory that's self-indulgence we don't need to be praying oh well you know God you know I only got this three series Mercedes now I know you want me to have the seven series so I'm gonna pray I know right now you're gonna make a way I need to I need the big one <laughs> I need this, you know, I only got a, a four bedroom house, you know, you know, I need to have a ten bedroom. I need this mansion. God, I don't know, my jet won't, won't get me international. Uh, this jet here is only good for domestic. I need a bigger jet with a bigger gas tank so I can fly across the ocean to share your word. <laughs> That's madness. <laughs> God's glory is to be used for individual purposes, for the good of others, not for self-glorification, not for anything that's going to benefit me. Because what benefits us is what benefits God. And He's responsible for keeping us in that position by giving us His glory. He's going to elevate us to a situation, but it's for His purpose. We have to be sensitive to anything we have, any opportunity we have to give something to somebody else and to be something more to somebody else, or some position to where we can show someone something or do something to somebody is for God's glorification, not for ours. This is very important, so uh, let's flip back to John 14. And I want to read this change.
that I hope will give us a sense of the gra gravity of what Jesus is talking about. In John 14, I'm gonna cover a few more than uh, transition for a while. In John 14, John chapter 14, starting verse 6, this is Jesus. talking uh, to Thomas and Jesus said to him <clears throat> I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me if you had known me you would have known my father also and from now on you know him and have seen him verse 8 says Philip said to him Lord show us the Father and it is sufficient for us Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? Who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So what Jesus is basically telling Philip here is, once you see me, you see the Father. I and the Father are one. So brothers and sisters, I'm just going to challenge us right now. Once the world sees us, if we're truly in God, we know our role, we get a grasp of our role, once they see us, they see the Father. So when you go to work or to school or wherever you go, at any time, in any given situation, once you're out dealing with anyone and they have to deal with you, they are not experiencing you. If we are one, you are one in the Father. If we're in a right relationship, they're not experiencing you, they are experiencing Father God. And I know that we may say, oh, I'm not God. Well, we are his delegated agent. <laughs> and we are as much of him as we want to be. But understand, as Jesus represented the Father, we represent the Father. And we can do his work. We just have to be sensitive to who we are in our role. And we don't deviate from our role. Because that's another trick of the, of the enemy. We have to be careful because he want to write a script too. He wants to get us off script. Just like when he challenged Jesus. If you are the son of God, do this. If you are the son of God, hey, this is not in the script. I'm not doing that. <laughs> if it is, told me, I'll be gone. <laughs> you give me trying to direct events here on this production that you have no authority <laughs> oh that's a whole different term we don't want to be guilty of that we don't want to be guilty of the enemy giving us directions and you know the director and movies from what little i see they move the characters of the, of the play of whatever the movie around so that the story can be told the way the director wants see the enemy wants to direct god's production <laughs> and we will not allow that if we believe Okay, briefly here, uh, I'm going to, uh, that was the first, that was our role. Now I want to look at four ways that we can assume these roles. And I will be quick with this here. Four ways, how do I assume these roles? I talked a lot about the roles and how we can do this and made us sound all these ways and talked about some things I know that uh, you may or may not have some questions about. But how do we assume this role? How can I do this? You said I can do this. How do I do this? First, uh, write down John 3, 3. I spoke about that, I think, the last time I was uh, was teaching here. In John 3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, and Jesus answered him, answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I said to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In verse 5, Jesus says, Most truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the first thing, we have to have that spiritual rebirth, because without it, we can't even perceive the kingdom of God. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it tastes like. We, we don't, can't experience it. 
So first is the new birth. I think that's pretty uh, cut and dry. The second thing, okay, I, I've been born again. I really truly believe I'm a true convert. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe God sent him. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he, he was resurrected on the third day. I believe he sits in the right hand of God in heaven, making an intercession on my I believe all this. What do I do with that? Well, I still need something here. Acts 1 8. Well, now let's look at seven. Well, now let's just do eight. Well, let's go five through eight. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at that time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the second step, I would like to say, put it that way, is once I recognize the kingdom, now I need the power. We need the power. We need the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness, to proclaim Christ, to show Christ, to be conducted, to conduct ourselves the way Christ would have us to, to do. So we need the Holy Spirit. Now I got the power. What, what do I need to do with the power? Very important. I'm glad you asked. You got the power, now what do you do with it? Romans 12, 1 and 2 is one way we can try to get an explanation. And I know you hear this, people with KCM, yeah, we hear this quite often. It's one of my favorite scriptures. But understand, I've been born again. I know what the kingdom of God looks like. You know what the kingdom of God looks like. Now I got the power to be a witness. Now what do I, I need to do to assume my role? Romans 12, 1 and 2 reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have to be willing to be changed. Have to, we have to willingly submit ourselves to change. Now notice I didn't say we have to change. Because <laughs> I've tried, I've had a pump, you know, see these New Year's resolutions, we said things with people, and I understand, I think they sincerely desire to make a change in whatever it is. But guess what, brothers and sisters, we don't have the power to do that <laughs> in and of ourselves. Romans 12 and 2, 12, 1 and 2 tells us that we will be transformed by renewing our mind and not conform to the world. See, the only way to see what the world system does is to be transformed out of it and look at it externally instead of internally. <laughs> see, when you're in the world, that's all you see is the world. We have no other reference point. But once we have been transformed out of the world, now you can look at the world and see the holistic effects of it. And that's what Satan does not want. That's why Christians are at different levels of effectiveness. See, once we get transformed, we get the true revelation of the impact, the negative impact of the world system. Not to go out and try to change it, but we need to know it. If I don't know that it's this destructive, then I think it's okay and I will participate in it. So God said we need to be transformed out of it. So now that we see the world as it is, there's only one more thing to do. If you would please write down 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it reads, We've been born again, we've got the power, we're submitting our chairs and we're willing to be changed and just the story that change is going to be an ongoing process. We're going to continually be changed. Whatever we need to be transformed in, we will be. Now there's one more step I feel we should take. And it reads, Therefore, 
my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Read that again. We're saved. We got the new birth. We got the power. We submit ourselves and we're willing to be changed and we're being changed. What we have to do right now is be steadfast. We have to be immovable. And we have to be constantly abounding in the work of the Lord. It means that motivates us. We're putting that for that's first priority, doing God's work. And why do we always do this? Know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So irregardless of what the results of all of this is, as far as our interaction with people, worldly people, that's nothing's in vain. Anything we do for God, there is no vanity in it. The results is not up to us. Because you can put forth an excellent play and you can look at critics. Some people look at the same production. Some people like it, some don't. Same with the Word of God. You can put the Word of God out or show the kingdom of God to some people and sometimes they're going to receive it, sometimes they're going to reject it. They're not receiving or, or rejecting you. They're receiving or rejecting whatever system you represent. And we have to understand, sometimes they, people in the world can't see it, you know, that there's a different way. But we're always persistent about that. I don't want to get into the evangelical process, but see, once, once we have decided, once we've got revelation of what we're to do, there's no turning back. There's no plan B. There's no alternative gospel. There's only one, and we're just going to proceed with it and trust God for the results. But thank you so much. I will close with a prayer. And uh, I get right back to you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word right now, Lord. I pray, Father God, that each of us will assume, attempt, uh, continue to realize our role in the kingdom, Father God, and will, Father God, embrace that role, Father God. We'll be mindful of what you called us to do, how you called us to do it, when you called us to do it, Father God, and to be aware, Father God, that you have glorified us, that each position, each is changed, everything that we are doing on your behalf, Father God, you've already preordained it and prearranged, Father God, us to be in those positions and to share and to reach out and to love people as you have instructed us to. And I pray, Father God, that we here at KCM will be even more effective at representing you, Father God, and we will stick to, Father God, your role for us. We won't deviate. We won't try to be fancy, Father God. We won't try to do what's popular, Father God. We will not change, Father God, for any other motive other than bringing additional honor and glory to you. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.